I used to sing a song when I was in a band when I was younger, and it was from the Georgia Satellites. And the song was Keep Your Hands to Yourself. Do you know that song? No, no, I don't. My honey, my baby, don't hand me no lines. Keep your hands to yourself. It's a really cool song, right? Everybody's heard it, but you just don't realize that you've heard it. And I got to meet Dan Beard, who walked into the bar one night, and we we sat down and ate cheeseburgers, you know, for half the night with with fourteen bottles of beer, and and just <laughs> kicked back doing that. And you know, of course, you know, there was other people like Billy Ray Cyrus was there, and and then lo and behold, you know, uh, Justin Timberlake. You know, the, I mean, the, it's such a small world down there, you know, so I, I was lucky to be around so many people that were just so talented and so wonderful to be around. And I learned a lot because um, Jeffrey Steele, who wrote all the songs for Rascal Flatts, My Wish and you know, all every song that you've, you've known from Rascal Flatts, basically he wrote it. Sean Dustin spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. Upon release in 2006, he had nothing but the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and legal paperwork. In 2010, he kicked a longtime methamphetamine habit and started the long climb back up the ladder of life. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. If you want transparency and authenticity, you're in the right place. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and this is Sean Dustin. Hey, what's up? This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Dustin. This is your first time listening or watching. Welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. It's good to have you with us. A couple of announcements. If you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button in the corner and thumbs the video up. If you're on Facebook, uh, like and share. I'd appreciate that. If you're on the podcast platforms, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. That definitely helps to make me more visible on the podcast platforms. You know, when you're scrolling through looking for different shows in the genre and you're not really sure what you want to, you know, check out, the more that you subscribe to my show, the higher up I will show up in that uh, list of shows. So that would definitely help. If you're getting anything out of what I'm doing here, uh, do me a favor, head on to my uh, link tree, which is right here, but it's available in the show notes as well and the description. All of the links to my guest, uh, to myself, the ways that you can support the show, my Patreon, what all of that is available down in the description. I'll be throwing them up uh, periodically here uh, through the broadcast as well. If you like the uh, StreamYard that I'm using, the, the broadcasting app, uh, there's an affiliate link that's in the uh, show notes and the description. Go ahead and check that out. And if you sign up, for a paid account, the first $25 that you spend, I'll get a credit too as well. And so that's another way that you can help support the show just by signing up through my affiliate link. Um, uh, let's see anything else. Uh, yeah, we have the Patreon. So if you like what I'm doing and you're getting value out of this and you want to know how you can help support the show even more, head over to my Patreon page. Uh, then that'll be available down in the description as well. And you'll see all the different benefits and perks that the uh, monthly subscribers get. And you can subscribe for as low as a dollar a month. You know, that's not much. You know, I got one, three, five, and 15, or not 15, but 10 uh, dollars a month with a lot of different uh, options there. So that's a, a great way to be able to support the show. My guest this evening that I have for you is Amber Rose Washington. Amber has been a producer, a music producer, uh, an artist. She's all kinds of different things in the music industry, and I'm going to let her tell you more about that when I bring her in here. Hi. What's up, Amber? How are you? How are you doing tonight? Good. I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for stopping by and hanging out with me and going through that whole little three minutes of... uh, 
of whatever, <laughs> whatever that was. Like I, I don't script any of this stuff out. So that's it, perfect. Yeah. You know, I fumble around with my, with my words quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you, uh, uh, tell everybody who you are and you know, what your background is in music and the entertainment industry. Okay. So for the entirety of my adult life, which is pretty long, believe it or not, I was uh, brought into the music industry at a young age, and I've been doing songwriting, producing, producing. I was a voiceover artist for a long time, and I was also into artist development. So I, I've, I've held a lot of hats doing that. I've worked with people in Los Angeles, Nashville, and in New York. I'm originally from New York. And most of my stuff was in, when I first started in the music business, I was actually doing smooth jazz. The stuff you don't really brag about, right? You don't like write <laughs> home to mom and say, hey, I'm the queen of smooth jazz. Hello. So you don't really talk about that much. But you know what's interesting is when I started doing it, it I started to really like what I was writing. And I got, I got asked to write a song for George Benson and Lou Rawls, if you remember those two cats, they were cool. And they were doing an album together, sort of a, you know, come back together album. And I was up to write a song for them. So I wrote this song and gave it to them and they really liked it. But the problem was they already had a song just like it. So Lou says, here, I want you to send this to a company that I know out of Seattle. I said, Seattle? I thought that was like the death wish right there, Seattle. What's in Seattle? I don't even know anything in Seattle. But I said, okay. So it turned out to be Muzak Incorporated. Muzak Incorporated is the the music that you hear behind the Weather Channel, elevator music, basically. Mm -hmm. So all the different hotels of the world. So your five-star hotels, like your Marriott's, your Hilton's, your Hyatt's, your Omni Internationals, your Sheridan's, and stuff like Macy's and Dillard's and Sears and JC Penney, all those big stores have music playing in the background. And I was in the rotation for about 16 years with my music. And I just got word last week. It's interesting you asked me that because just last week I got news that some of my music is up to 112 million listens, which is pretty crazy. That's a lot of listens. I didn't, know that that many people were interested in that style of music, but apparently there are. So the other part was, you know, doing some production work. I worked with people that were going to go on American Idol, people that were going to go on The Voice, people that were going to go on America's Got Talent. I would help them get over stage fright, which is incidentally what my second book is that's coming out in June, to get over stage fright. And I had a particular way that I did this with people. So... Being a producer, you know, it, you, you wear a lot of hats when you're a producer. You're not just, you know, a lot of people think a producer is just one thing, but there's a whole lot that goes behind being a producer. And a lot of it is mundane, to tell you the truth, but there's a lot of creative fun stuff that happens too. I did a show in upstate New York with the guys from The Sopranos and Goodfellas, and they are a hoot to work with, let me tell you what. They are... They're exactly like they are in The Sopranos, that they act the same exact way. It's it's really kind of comical when 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 you're sitting right next to them and they they, they have that New York forget about it sort of thing. Forget going on. about it. Yeah, forget you know, about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they, they they are they are all they're cracked up to be. I don't think they're actually acting when they're talking about the mafia to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I was actually the producer of a show that did uh, sort of an American Idol offshoot for five different states in the northern, eastern, northeastern corridor of the United States. And we had a few thousand people that, that we had to interview, and uh, the, the show went off. You know, it was in front of a live audience of about 4,000 people. And it was kind of a fun gig for me because I got to work with, you know, Paula Abdul's entourage and – these guys from HBO and everything else. And I was actually the producer of the show. So that was kind of a cool thing for me as well. And after that, a lot of people that actually made the cut were going to go to Boston. I don't even say it like Bostonians. How do they say Boston. it? Boston. You're going to Boston. Boston. Yeah, Boston. Going to Boston. Yeah. So the, 
they, they're going to go to Boston. And what a lot of people don't realize is 25,000 people descend on this little arena or, or maybe even a, a ballpark thinking they're going to get an audition. But the reality is, is that only 1,500 of you are going to get an audition and you get a little wristband. And people like myself are the people that get you that wristband, you know, sort of the inside track. And so I got a few of these people wristbands because they, they actually did very well in the competition and said, listen, this is these, these are the people you're going to be singing in front of, but they aren't going to be Simon. You're not going to meet Simon and, and, and Paula and all of them. You're going to be dealing with 23-year-old producers, right? 23-year-old producers that are sort of going to say, hey, this person's really good. Or conversely, they might say, oh, this person really sucks. We need them for the show. This will be hilarious. You know, that's what they do, <laughs> right? I mean, you used to watch American Idol where they would actually have some people like, how the hell did they even make it through the, the, the initial round? Because they wanted that laugh track, you know, they want, and it was sad because a lot of these people really took themselves pretty seriously with that. And <laughs> they, they just completely blew it. And they, they, they were kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were, they were, they were purposely brought on the show to fail. Yeah, they got set up. Yeah. So a lot of these people, when they first get to the show, oh, my God, Mom, Dad, I'm going to Hollywood. They have no idea what's going to hit them in the head. Mm-hmm. So they go to the Kodak Theater, and <laughs> there's there's 4,500 seats there. And they look, and they're like, Sorry. holy, holy shit. You know, I'm, I'm here. And they don't know how to handle it. They get stage fright really bad. And so I, I would say to some of them, I would say, listen. Let's turn the lights on and let's see what happens. So the lights come on and these folks say, where did the audience go? I said, yeah, that's the beauty of this. When, when you're on stage performing, whether, whether I was opening up a concert for a big group or if I was, you know, as a musician or if I was, you know, just teaching people how to do this, they don't realize that 90% of the audience disappears. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's let's just say it's four thousand people. Thirty nine hundred of them are going to disappear magically because of the lights on you. So you got to deal with 100 people. So if you can handle that, you're you're well on your way. Then comes the beauty of it. Now you have to pick out five of those people in the audience and you need to sing to them. But your teachers in high school did it all wrong. They all taught you to look at the wall behind them. It still gives the appearance that you're looking at them. Right. So like if I'm looking at you, Sean, I'm. Well, if I look at you, I'm not looking at my camera. So, but if I'm looking at you and I look at, at the wall behind you, it looks like I'm looking at you, but I'm really not. So what our teachers teach us is, is passive aggressive behavior. And that's yeah. really not the way to deal with stage fright. So I teach them, I want you to look at two people in your life, the way you're about to do what I'm going to teach you. One is going to be me right now. The other person in your life is going to be when the day you get married, when you look into your spouse's eyes, whether it's a husband or a wife or whatever, those you're going to look deep into the person that you're singing to his eyes. Do you know why? And they would all shrug and go, I have no idea. I said, did your, your school teacher ever, you know, purposely look at you as they're teaching the course? Yeah. How did that make you feel uncomfortable and sometimes creepy? I said, fantastic. That's what we're shooting for here. We're going to turn the stage. So the way to get over stage fright is to turn the stage on the audience, make them uncomfortable. H- have the audience member go, holy shit, they're looking straight at me. They're singing right at me. This person on stage is looking right at me. So you sort of build this rapport with this single person in the audience and then another person over on the other side of the stage and so on. And at the same time, you're not allowed to look at the boom cameras that are moving all around you, right? So that was a real trip because there was a lot of people that were so scared and they said, so all right, I'm going to sing to 100 people. I'm still scared. I said, it's not the 100 people you should be scared of. It's 112 million that are going to be watching on TV. <laughs> you should be scared. <laughs> That's when they, they had a complete breakdown. But, um, yeah, it was the music industry was a lot of fun for me. I've, I've worn a lot of hats in my life. And the big thing in my life is I had to overcome stage fright myself because in the music industry, I was really, really good at what I did. But I was afraid when I first started and it's because I was born differently than most people. I was born incongruent. I was born with a condition called incongruity. A lot of people mess that up and just understand this one word called transgender, right? 
And they sort of have this weird stereotype of what it is, and they don't really understand the truth behind it. So what I like to do is approach it from the medical standpoint, which is a condition called incongruity. And I had to get over that stage right in my life because my book that, that we're going to talk about is called Hiding from Myself. And that's what I did most of my life. I was hiding from myself because society has a way of making you feel like garbage if you don't fit in the proper way. And, you know, we accept people that have leukemia. We accept people that have cleft palate. We accept people that have congenital heart defects or conjoined twins or whatever. But as soon as we put sex or gender into one of those birth anomalies, we get diarrhea of the brain. You know, it's really bizarre how society works. And the reality of it is that there is a medical reason, a physiological reason that I ended up the way I was. I, I was actually born this way. So when we say we're born this way, it's because our brains in the second trimester of pregnancy, this is what the, the going in the medical industry is right now. So what they think is happening, and of, of course, they don't even know why certain kids get leukemia, but yet we know it happens, right? So same thing with transgender people. The current thought in the medical industry, and there's been a lot of studies on this, is that the first trimester, your body and your reproductive organs differentiate. And during the second trimester, your brain actually starts to differentiate physically. So we all know, well, hopefully we all know, that in a natal female, the cortical region of the brain is very thin, I mean, very thick. It's very thick in a female. In a male, it's very thin. Now, something in the second trimester of, of pregnancy happens where my body, people like me, reject that differentiation. And we end up incongruent, thus the word incongruity, where your brain is physically different than your body, right? Now, there's a whole host of reasons that you can be transgender. This is just one of them, right? I don't speak for the entire transgender community, right? However, that being said, it try, trying to state it in this light helps people understand this a little bit better because society has a way of creating their own misinformation campaigns and mythology around this. And it's, it's really nobody's fault, except when you go back to the early 1900s, you have the film industry in particular constantly making us the brunt of the jokes, right? The guy in the dress, that sort of thing. And they would make fun of people. And what that has an effect of doing over time is making the world a dangerous place for people like me. The most vulnerable, marginalized group of people on the planet are transgender women of color. There's more murders and violent crimes. Like the violent crimes that happen aren't just like, hey, I'm gonna shoot you or something. They actually ritualistically kill people like, like us. And it's, it's sad because humans are always afraid of what they don't understand for some reason. And it's, and it's a sad thing because a lot of these people are, are just, everybody is, is the same. Like you just heard me. I just came out here and I said, I've been pretty popular with the music business. I, I haven't even told you any of my successes yet. I just, I just told you what I used to do, but I could list successes for the next hour if I wanted to of what I've done. And that's because, you know, these people that say you have some sort of mental issue are incorrect. If I had some sort of mental issue, I wouldn't have been able to enjoy the successes that I've had in my life. And, you know, even if it was some sort of uh, mental condition, you know, it's funny. They, they look at that and they say, yeah, you're mentally whatever, because the DSM says so. The DSM has shown time and time again, that it's been incorrect. And in fact, the American Asso uh, Psych Psychiatric Association that puts out the DSM has revamped that, just like the WHO, the World Health Organization, the NIH, all of these different organizations that, that say that this is, not, this is not a mental health concern at all. This is, this is more physiological than anything else. And in fact, when you think about the people that are struggling with this. When you think about the mental issues that are involved, they, they call it gender dysphoria, right? We've all heard of that term before and that's what we associate it with. Well, you don't have to have gender dysphoria to be transgender. Gender dysphoria is a mental health issue that goes from zero to 100 
and everywhere in between. And it's no different than people with anxiety disorder or depression. There's 66 million people in America that are suffering from anxiety and or depression. So when people make those accusations, they're doing it in, in, in sort of a, I hate, the, I hate this word, I really do, ignorant, because it's used so much, but it is kind of ignorant. And you're really offending 66 million, you're offending 66 million Americans, if that's the case. I happen to belong to the most marginalized community in the world. I belong to a group of people where 0.7% of the human population is actually transgender or born incongruent. You know, yeah. you have questions? You have questions? <laughs> um, no, not, not, I don't have any questions yet. Uh, but okay. what I do want to, what I do want to do is I want to get to some of these comments. Uh, Cheryl, uh, has been commenting, uh, first she, uh, congratulations on the 110 million, uh, listens that you had. Um, and then also she had a God bless your heart, Amber, or God bless you, Amber Rose. Um, so well, yeah, and, and Cheryl was, uh, one of our sponsors for Indie Pods United, uh, IPU 20 last year. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate thank that. Thank you, Cheryl. That was nice of you. Yeah. She also, oh, I see it now. I see it. It's on my screen now, too. Okay. Good. <laughs> and so Cheryl owns a company called, or a brand called, uh, Rockabella Vodka. So shout out to Rockabella Vodka. Thank you, Cheryl. Hey, okay, salute. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the reason, so another, th this was really the reason why I, I had you on the show, um, but I didn't put any of that or try to sell it as, um, you know, I didn't, I don't even think I put transgender in any, the, the title, I think, I don't even, I said something about my stuff in the, my connection to, to, to having a transgender sibling, but that's about it. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is that I wanted that's not a focal point. You know I, what I mean? That That's not a focal point of, of like who you are. That's like a, that's a, that's like a, a feature of who you are, but that's not, that's not who you are. Right. It's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. This doesn't define me. It's just part of who I am. I mean, I just am. That's just like anybody else is who they are. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. And then, you know, there, th that's gotta be difficult. And like I said, I have a, I have a sibling who's my sister and she, uh, she was, it was my brother, but it's now my sister. Um, I, ha I don't, I accept it and I accept anybody that, that, that has that, uh, or that deals with that or is going through that. I think it's a little, di it's a little different when it's a family member. And we had talked about this before, um, yeah. for the, for the simple fact is, is that, that, and this is my opinion only, um, it, it was like that sibling died, right? It was like my brother died physically, you know, and, and like the things that I used to be able to do, like play ball and all that other stuff with them, basketball, like all of that stopped. Yeah. And so it was, you know, all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is who I am. This is who you need to accept me as. But I, we never really got a chance to um, grieve the loss of, of, of Derek. Right. Can I, can I put you, let, let's just cover that one thing. You just said a lot there, believe it or not. Let's, let's cover that and then go to the next part that you have, if you don't mind, because yeah. that's a lot. So this is something that we as humans do a lot. We, we, we sort of have a way of projecting, right? This is something in psychology we call projection. We project onto other people who we think they are instead of really looking empathetically at who they've been their whole life and how they've been hiding that from you because they're scared. And the only reason they came out to you, here's the kicker. This is going to kick you in, in the tear ducts. The reason that they came out to you specifically is because you mean something important to them in their life. You are so important to them, and your support system is so important to them that they had no choice but to come out to you and say, this is who I am, and I love you, and I, I don't want to lose you. And so many people in, the, in, in my position lose their families, their loved ones, their friends, because they don't want to understand what this really is. They think, well... If it's, this is true, they would have come out a lot earlier. No, we're scared to death. There's people being killed for being transgender. Just because you're different, you get killed. Or like my experience was in high school and in grade school. I was 
I, people didn't know I was trans. In fact, when I grew up, that wasn't even a word yet. But, you know, when I was in school, I was bullied a lot. And those same kids that bullied me would bully the hell out of me and then say, but we're friends, right? We're still friends, right? Bully, 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 bully. But we're friends, right? They know who they are. And they don't see it. They don't, they, they say, oh, she's full of shit. That didn't happen. It's because they project what they think was happening. They're not in my body. They weren't experiencing the humiliation they were causing me for years and years and years. So they don't really understand. And what I'm going to say to you is that whether you're straight or gay, whether you're cisgender, do, do you and your audience understand what cisgender is? Yeah, cis is straight, right? Straight, regular, normal. No, cis means on the same side of, which means which means I am congruent. So if you're if you were assigned male at birth, you're great with that. You love that. If you're assigned female at birth, you're congruent and you're great with that. There's no incongruity. For transgender people, we are incongruent. Therefore, for you, and let's pick on you just for a minute, Sean. You were born congruent. Therefore, you don't have any framework of understanding for this because there wasn't a single millisecond in your life that you ever had to think about it. You had an innate sense that you're male. You were never, you never consciously said, hey, I'm a guy. I wonder why I'm not a girl. Huh, I'm a guy. You never had that thought because you're congruent. So it stayed in your subconscious as an innate sense of who you are. For transgender people, people that are incongruent, we have an amazing uh, experience of where it's, it's a hurting pain that's incredibly conscious every day of our lives. It's a conscious thought. So 0.7% of the human population has a framework of understanding because we're born this way. And it is a conscious thought. 99.3% of y'all never had a conscious thought like this. So this, this seems as foreign as Martians landing on earth to you. But it's, it's the reality of, of our lives, and we've been around forever. Here's a great example that nobody knows about. Some people do, but this will blow some people's minds. Back in 1981, there was a James Bond movie. It was called For Your Eyes Only. Do you remember that movie? Mm-hmm. I remember the Bond girl. She's so awesome, right? I, I always wanted to be her when I, when I grew up, right? Because, you know, the Bond girl, right? And what people don't know is that she's transgender, she was from the UK. Her name was Caroline Cossey, otherwise known as Tula, right? Mm-hmm. So she was she was the James Bond girl in For Your Eyes Only. And then she did, a year after that, a Playboy spread, the first transgender person to do a Playboy spread. And the interesting thing is most people don't even know that she was trans. They, they you know, and a lot of people today think, oh, look at all these people, you know, they're they're identifying as transgender, blah, blah. It's a big fad. It's not a fad. It's that there's now a conversation happening and more and more of us are coming out at an earlier age because we're not afraid anymore. And, you know, if we can live our lives as congruent as possible, and here's a great homework assignment for everyone. Being that I was in a music business, I'm going to, I'm going to refer to a music, a person in the music business right now. Her name, write this down is Kim Petras, P E T R A S Kim Petras. Look up, a, look up a few of her songs. Uh, one is called Heart to Break. Another one is called Icy, I-C-Y. She is, she is from Germany, and she was put on um, what we call puberty blockers when she was 12 years old, which means she didn't have to go through the incorrect puberty the first time, which a lot of us had to, which is absolutely terrible. And... By the age of 16, she had what we call GCS or gender confirmation surgery, something that I had last year. And that is otherwise known as vaginoplasty, right? So, so that, um, is it necessary? Absolutely not. So if you're transgender and you're listening to this, it's not necessary. You know, everybody equates us to genitals and it has nothing to do with it. But my experience made me absolutely need to fix that part of me but not everybody's going to be the same with that because we are on a spectrum sort of like zero to 100 with that gender is a spectrum you know people see sex and gender as the same thing but they're really two different things you know male female well it's not exactly male female is it because we have people that are intersex right so there's intersex which you used to call hermaphrodite 
right? But that's a derogatory term. We don't use that term. It's called intersex. So that's people born with ambiguous genitalia. I have friends, some of them famous, believe it or not, that are born with a uterus, a vagina, a penis, a prostate, the, the whole, you know, both sets of genitals. And, and then there's people that have varying degrees of each of those in like a million different iterations, you know, someone born with this and this, but not that, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's a condition that, that happens quite, you know, I can't give you the number right now off the top of my head. I didn't think that I'd have this discussion, but, you know, <laughs> off the top of my head, you know, there's quite a few people that are born intersex as well. And what hap- used to happen is they would allow the parents and the doctor to decide, okay, this person is born with both sets of genitalia. So what do you want them to be? And they would go to the parents and make the parents decide. But guess what? There's only one human being on this planet that can, that can understand who they are, right? And that's the person themselves. So what we've advocated for, and, and successfully, I might add, is that if people are intersex, don't, don't make the choice of, of what it is because it's not a choice. You know, we know who we are. Right, you know, right from the moment of articulation, the the age of articulation runs from about three years old to eight years old. So believe it or not, Sean, you knew exactly that you were a man and you sort of knew, kind of knew who you were going to be attracted to. Even though you used to say girls are icky, you know, you kind of knew that, you know, you were going to be attracted to girls and, and that you're a guy and, and you were being treated as one. And you were getting haircuts while your sister, if you have one, was getting longer hair and doing other things. So you understood innately there was a, a difference between the two, whereas, you know, these people don't get a, a say in their lives and someone else is making a decision for them. So they think that we're making a decision. My decision in my life was to live most of my life disingenuous to myself and to the people that I love. And it was out of fear, enormous enormous fear. I mean, I could cry right now. That's how, that's how strongly it, it, it affects people because each and every day is a challenge. Not for me so much. I'm, you know, when you cross over to, you know, from, from invisible to quasi public figure, which, which now, unfortunately, that's what they're calling me, but I don't, I don't enjoy that because out of the woodwork comes the, the nasty grams and, it's just unbelievable to me that there's so many insecure people out there that that would rather tear somebody's humanity down than try to understand what it really is, you know? And that's where all the myth, mythology comes in and the misinformation about us. Like, for example, there are people that, that are cross-dressers, right? They like to wear women's clothing and do weird things inside of the women's clothing and then take it off. It's like kind of gross. And then there's people that are, then there's people that are drag queens, like RuPaul, that stuff. I'm transgender. I'm incongruent, right? I'm more congruent than I used to be. And I can tell you, I have absolutely nothing in common with those people, right? I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not demonizing anybody. I have a lot of friends that are drag queens and and cross-dressers. That's fine. You know, that's your humanity or whatever, but that is not transgender, right? Now, there are some people that are transgender that are those things or perceive themselves to being those things. That's where it gets complicated. And that should be recognized that, you know, a lot of people call themselves a cross-dresser because they are stuck in a room in their house while nobody's around trying to get a glimpse of who they really are, right? For me, I was a cross-dresser wearing a suit, you know, that, that, that's, that's my experience. So for me, I could wear, you know, full on military garb all day long and I'm still a woman. It, it has nothing to do with clothing. It, you know, people that have a sexual fetish, however, that's not transgender. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to put my foot down right there. If you are just a person that has some sort of sexual fetish and, and there's a lot of them out there and they are conflating, you know, what it is to be transgender with some sexual activity that's objectifying women. And and I stand strongly against that. I'm kind of a feminist in that way and, you know, agree or disagree with that. But the reality is, is that that has nothing to do with my humanity. And it actually makes my life more dangerous if, if they try to put themselves underneath my umbrella. And I don't say my umbrella lightly, 
because there's millions of us under this umbrella. And we're trying to do the best we can to be inclusive. And quite honestly, I wish we lived in, in an age where there was no need for labels. But unfortunately, we still need labels because we still need to we still need to advocate for those that are that are marginalized. You know, Black Lives Matter, for example. I mean, the reason that exists is because there's a group of human beings that are at risk more than others. You know, breast cancer awareness. You know, well, you know, I, can you imagine someone going to a breast cancer awareness fundraiser and saying, well, I'm not giving you a dime. Well, why? Because you didn't, you didn't say all, you know, all cancer awareness. See where I'm going with that? Yeah. It just makes sense. You know, people want to, they want to keep to their original ideologies and dogmatic views rather than understand that the reason we have labels and the only reason we have labels is to advocate for people that are underserved and marginalized, you know? So <laughs> that was a long way to go around to answer your question. But when you, when you think about your position and, and having to deal with that in your family, a lot of us want to grieve. Right. I, I went through this with my own family where they wanted to grieve and grieving is an important thing. Us as transgender people have to allow for that grieving because it's an important thing because we're all human beings and we all we all see things from our own perspective. So the important thing is not to project. I shouldn't project and neither should the other side project. So there has to be some sort of symbiotic relationship there where where you understand that this person has come to you and said, I have been trying to live my life the best I can according to what society thinks I should be, but I am not that. My brain has told me since I was born that I'm not this. And they're, they're trusting, they're entrusting you to sort of shelter them and support them in, in this very scary moment in their lives. Coming out is so scary because we're so afraid of losing. And that's why a lot of us never come out. Some there's some people that go to their grave without coming out and I just want to let people know that if someone in your family or someone that you know comes out to you, they're coming out because you're important in their life. And don't take that lightly because everybody's humanity deserves an understanding. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just like leukemia, doctors do not know to this very day why some kids get leukemia at, at six months old or even born with it and others don't. They try to figure it out through genomics and all sorts of things, and they've not come to a conclusive, you know, argument as to why it happens. But yet we know it happens. Same thing with people that are transgender or what I like to call incongruity. I don't really like the word transgender. I'm going to be honest with you because I'm not changing gender. My gender has never changed in my whole life. I was always a girl. My brain from four years old, I, I remember I was sitting with my mom. Actually, I was kneeling next to my bed because I was, I was brought up Catholic. And I'm kneeling next to my mom. And I said my, the final part of the Lord's Prayer, and lead us not in tempta temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And she says, very good. Now let's say some prayers together. Let's bless mommy and daddy. And let's bless your sister and your friends and our relatives. And I did all that. And she goes, now I want you to go ahead and I want you to make a special wish to God yourself. So anything you want, just talk to God right now. I'm four years old. I don't know what to say. <laughs> this is foreign to me. I'm like, I don't even know. Where is this guy? You know, I don't know. I didn't know who he was. So I just got my hands up to my head, went down to the bed. And I said, God, please fix me by morning. And my mom goes, oh, honey, what's the matter? And she put her hand to my head like I had a fever or something. Do you not feel well? And I said, no, it's not that, Mom. And then after a few moments, and I was crying at the time, she goes, what is what is bothering you? And I said, am I a boy and a girl, Mom? And she goes, what? Why would you say such a thing? No, you're just my handsome little boy. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I wish your name was Jack right now, because let me tell you something, Jack. <laughs> when my mom said that, I was so heartbroken, because... My brain always said, you know, you're a girl. I didn't know the difference, you know, anatomically. I just knew I was being treated differently than my sister. Why was my sister allowed to have her hair grow out long and I had to get a crew cut? Why was my sister permitted to go to ballet, which I loved, and, and, and I wasn't? 
And why was my sister allowed to get a, a beautiful canopy bed with Holly Hobby on her wallpaper? And I had like brown paneling and, and New York Yankee stuff. I mean, it was just, <laughs> everything was ass backwards for me. And, and she didn't really understand at that point, but she knew something was going on. So she says the following, a lot of young kids, and she was a nurse. She did the best she could with this. A lot of young kids get confused because growing up is such a hard thing. Don't worry, honey. This is just a phase. You're going to be absolutely fine. Trust me. So she tucked me in. She she kissed me on the forehead. And I started to fall asleep saying, wow, mom just said I'm going to be okay. Listen, at four years old, when your mom says you're going to be okay, that's there's only two people you trust, mommy and daddy, when, when, you're, when you're that age. And when mommy says you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. You can bet your ass you're going to be okay. So the next day went on, the next week, the next month, the next few months. And things were not getting okay. Nothing was getting okay. And then she started to realize that. So God bless my mom in heaven. I love you, mom. She stuck by my side my entire life. She protected me. She knew that I was different. She didn't know what the word was because back then the only word that was roaming around was something called transsexual. Mm. And, And she didn't know what to call what I was going through. But she knew that it was real because she knew that I was really upset and distraught over it. And it was right around that same time when we saw the movie Grease. I don't know if you saw the movie. Everybody saw the movie Grease. Please tell me you saw the movie Grease. (laughs) I I was in that play in high school, actually. Okay, there you go. This is awesome. So in Grease, you know, everybody would would come back to school the next next, after the summer and say, oh, that was such a good movie. And. And, you know, Olivia Newton-John, the guys, the guys in the class would go, Olivia Newton-John, oh, she's hot. Summer and, loving, yeah, having right. a blast. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you don't dare talk about John Travolta, right? That For guys that, you know, that's, no, 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 no. You know, you fag, don't do that. That's what they would say. So, you know, I would talk to my girlfriends and I would say, oh, my God. So one conversation with some boys on the block, I said, oh, I thought that movie was so great. Didn't Wasn't it cool how how... Sandra D, I mean, Olivia Newton-John would come out in different summer dresses every scene. Every dress was, like, different every time, and they were so cute. And and she had these silk, she had these silk bands in her hair, and, and every, it seemed like every scene she had a different color. How did they do that? And they looked at me and they said, what? What are you saying? <laughs> they didn't understand where I was coming from. They are like, what is wrong with you? And, you know, of course, the girls would say, oh, John Travolta, I want to be his girlfriend. And I would say the same thing. To, you know, I was just another one of the girls back then, and I would say, I, I, I thought, yeah, he's really cute. I really like John Travolta. So I would say with a double whammy. My sexual orientation is such that I, I'm attracted to, to men. I'm attracted to guys. And, you know, my gender identity, I'm female. So here's the interesting part of that. When I was little, I was looked at as a little boy. When I was a teenager, I was looked at as a teenage boy, right? I went through puberty the wrong way. Right. All these things. But I wasn't gay. Mind screw. Mind screw. (laughs) I wasn't gay. I thought of myself as a heterosexual female because I already identified as female. I just didn't understand why my body looked the way it did. Hmm. It was it's really complicated. And it's not confusion. A lot of people think it's confusion. The only confusion you have is why am I not allowed to be myself? And, you know, why did. God stick these different things on me that other people don't have. And, you know, so I was attracted to boys, you know, especially John Travolta and all the usual suspects of the seventies and eighties and so on and so forth. And the, then they said, you know, Oh yeah. When I grow up, I want to have kids. I want to have two kids. And I'd say, yeah, I want to have two kids. And they'd say, you can't have two kids. You're a boy. You're not a girl. And I would be like so upset because we didn't have internet back then. So don't, don't, tease me right away but (laughs) before the internet i was 11 years old i I admit this i was 11 years old and i still didn't realize that i there's no possibility for me to get pregnant right i'm not going to be able to carry a child i didn't know this because you know i'm 11 years old and i'm stupid and you know i can't i came from a town let me preface that with i came from the the county that dirty dancing is based upon Mm. so the movie Dirty Dancing is based on the area I grew up in. And when we wanted to get, you know, 
counseling or psychology or whatever, there were more deer than people. So you'd go out to the woods and talk to the deer, not to a psychologist, right? There, there's just so <laughs> many. We lived in the backwoods, right? Everybody says, oh, you're from New York. So what part of Brooklyn? What part of – no, I was from the Catskill region. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a pretty quiet – unassuming place and there weren't many people there it was very very backwoods which can cause people like me to be even more afraid and by the time I was 13 I ended up having a boyfriend and I had to explain the whole thing to him you know and that was really confusing at the time because I had to tell him I'm not gay and he sort of raised his eyebrow because he was right and I was like oh, sit down, let's have a talk. And I had to sit him down. And you know something? For a kid in the early 80s, he was spot on. He he grasped, when I said everything I said to him about who I really was, he, he took on to it. And for the next nine months, we had a little thing going on. It was wonderful. And um, so there's your long roundabout 400 minute you know, <laughs> hey, um, you're making my job a lot easier. I don't have to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to pull teeth and which I, I, I appreciate. And, uh, I appreciate your story too, you know, and, and your honesty. I want, I want to, I want to swing around and ask one, one question. Um, and it's kind of a controversial, uh, part of where we are with, with, uh, this, I guess, like I still, I still don't even know how to how to address it, right? I always feel like I'm I'm going to stumble and say the wrong like the wrong thing. Uh, it's called the diversity of the human condition. It's the diversity. That's all of it. Yeah, diversity, diversity of the, of the human yeah. condition. Okay, so the age at which. Because there's a lot of pu- the puberty bro- puberty blockers you had mentioned. Um, you've got uh, you know trans individual or what, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. In in sports now, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you've got so there. Like when I think about this, and you you explained it to me uh, somewhat. Like when you stop when you stop uh, the the estrogen or when you stop hormones at a certain age versus you know somebody that 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 gets on puberty blockers versus somebody like yourself that went longer until yeah. your bones developed and, and, you know, you have a, you're, you're structurally, you know, more of a man. Um, than- Not anymore, sweetheart, that that all disappears after two years on HRT. So like my bone structure is a lot smaller and, and weaker now. And I have to worry about osteoporosis and my muscle mass has shrunken down to nothing. Um, from where, where it was. And it takes about two years. If you look at the Olympic committee, the Olympic committee really set the, the guidelines for the entire world on this issue. And, you know, the, the doctors from the NIH, the WHO, all these different organizations that are, are medical in, in nature, took a look at all of the different factors that are out there, took a look at all of the different mythology that exists out there, such that you know, obviously, if you have bigger bones, then you're going to actually outperform women. That's that's I, I'm just going to be flat out. That's bullshit. That has nothing to do with the argument whatsoever. People. In fact, this whole argument isn't even about people in the Olympics or people in professional sports, because, quite frankly, in the history of history, there's never been a single transgender woman that is actually qualified for the Olympics. Think about that for a moment. While we all spew hatred about transgender people in sports. We've had a lot of transgender women try out for the Olympics on the women's teams, but none of them have qualified to date. Never qualified. Keep that in the back of your mind as I move forward. The the issues that we're speaking about here, and this goes for the NCAA also, the collegiate area has it under control as well. They understand, you know, how this works and that a lot of this is based on, on endocrinology right? It's, you know, there's a lot of metrics that go into a great sports person. For example, I had growing up, I saw it firsthand. There were parents in my own little town that were so sports happy, they would actually hire a a professional coach for their kid. And that kid would go on to be one of the best pitchers in our thing. In fact, we had someone locally that went to the minor leagues uh, that, that 
ended up pitching for a minor league professional team because of that. And there's something to be said about, about learning a skill, right? And there's also something about if somebody, if somebody is on, on HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy for two years, your bone mass, it, 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 it's less, right? If you're, if you're six foot tall, you're still going to be six foot tall or, or right around there. Right. But that has, that, that, that's really not the, the metric that we're using with sports to, to, to see that because there's a lot of tall women too. There's a lot of women. Like if you went today up against Serena Williams, right. She'd kick your ass, right. Cause she's really good with tennis. Right. So there's a lot of skill in there. There's a lot of muscle memory built into this. And just because somebody, you know, was born, you know, externally as, as male or signed at birth as male, you know, that is not the deciding factor. And I, I welcome everybody to look up this information on the NIH and other websites that actually did the research. I am not the know-all on this subject, but I can tell you this. The issue that we're speaking about is, is in the high school, junior high and high school uh, sports, where unfortunately somebody that's transgender is going through puberty the wrong way because they're too scared to come out at first. So they're already on their way through the wrong puberty. Therefore they have testosterone in their body. And then they say, I'm a transgender girl. And then they compete with, with, with them. I see where, where everybody's going with that argument. Do I have the answer? I don't have the answer. I'm sorry. I'm not qualified to give an answer on that. And if I, if I tried to come across as some pretentious person that did know the answer to that, I, I would be doing myself a disservice. But the reality is, is if you look at the person I said before, Kim Petras, if you look at her in her videos, and you will see exactly what happens to people like me if we're not forced to go through the wrong puberty. By the way, puberty blockers have been available for about 41 years. People don't realize this. 41 years. They've been used really extensively in the past 11 years. 11 years. Do you know why, sweetie, why it's become an issue, a hot topic? You know, puberty blockers. Let's have 12 states now blocking puberty blockers with transgender people. It's disgusting. These people are, are completely, I'm just going to call it like it is, they're morons. They don't understand what they're doing. They're actually predicating their whole argument on religious nonsense. They're not even basing it on reality. On, on, they're actually going against the medical establishment, which has been telling them and slapping them on a hand saying, no, 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 you got this all wrong. And when you go through puberty the right way the first time, you end up like Kim Petras. I dare you to look at her. Everyone that's listening to this right now, go out there and look at Kim Petras and, and look at what she's doing in her videos. Does she look like a sad girl? Does she look like she's regretting going through puberty as a woman instead of a man, like the courts and these clowns in, in Arkansas and in Alabama are stating we do? They're full of nonsense. They used, they used the testimony of an 80-year-old man who said they were transgender and detransitioned and said it was the worst mistake of their life. They're using that as evidence, supporting evidence. That is the exception. That is absolutely the exception. Well over 99% of us that are transgender, and remember, we only constitute 0.7% of the population. Well over 99% of us are absolutely living our best lives because we're being more congruent. Unfortunately, people like me have to do it the hard way. We have to do it the hard way because we have to go through serious, painful surgeries to be correct. Now, if I didn't go through the, if I didn't go through puberty the wrong way the first time, I would have not gained any muscle mass. I would have had every part of my body naturally grow just as any other, just as any other, uh, you know, woman. And same thing goes for girls. Um, and I'm saying this incorrectly. I apologize. Transgender males. So a transgender man right? Someone that is, uh, that is assigned female at birth that, that is identifying as, as a male, right? So assigned female at birth, you're, 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 you're identifying as a male. And I hate that word too, identifying as like, do I go up to you, Sean, and say, what do you identify as? No, that, that, that's stupid. 
you know, I don't like people saying to me, oh, so you identify as a woman. No, no dipshit. I'm just a woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> I call it like it is, you know? Yeah. It's, it's more of a punchline now more than anything. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And, and, you know, Kim is a wonderful girl. She, she, um, I think she's 28 now and she, I have her up this, on the screen. Oh, I see her. There's a, there's a cute picture of her. Yeah. If you watch her videos, you know, She's a little risque and stuff, but, you know, so are all the other, you know, pop singers her age. So, but listen to her voice sometime. That's something I had to overcome. The voice you're hearing right now, by the way, my voice, Sean, was probably half an octave to a full octave deeper than yours. There, there are a lot of announcers. Uh, remember Hal Douglas, the one that's did In a World, you know, the, the, the movie trailer guy? My yeah, voice yeah, yeah. was very similar to his and very similar yeah. to, yeah, exactly. I had that voice. In fact, I used to do a lot of concert spots and it was so dysphoric for me that after I would do the spot, I would immediately break down in tears. I was crying. I was just like, I need the money, but here we go. And I would start doing that voice. And being that I was in the music business, it was easy for me to recalibrate my voice. Like I wake up in the morning and this is my voice. This is my natural speaking voice. You don't find this voice. It just... It's just there. But unfortunately, if you're, if you're going through puberty the wrong way, you know, it's interesting when you look at, when you look at the vocal folds, this is what they look like. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that from, from sort of a sexual way that looks like a, an appendage on, on a female. Right. So mm -hmm. if you take that on, on, on male puberty, it, the, the lining gets very thick. Right. And it, and it's all stretched out. That's why, it, you know, it's elongated. That's why your voice is so deep and rich, right? In a, in a female, it's closed up. See how that's a little tighter there? It's closed up and it's thinner. The lining is thinner, which makes more of a, an airy voice. And you'll, you'll notice most, most females, not all, but because everybody's different. But you'll notice a characteristic is that there's more of a sing-song with voice with, with a, a female, Whereas a male tends to speak very, very monotone. I, I just speak down here all the time in blah, blah. You know, women don't typically do that. And I don't know if that's really a genetic trait or if that's a societal trait. Because, you know, if it was a societal thing, you would, tend, you would think that there would be certain cultures or certain women someplace that just wouldn't talk like that. But you see this all around the world. You know, depending, it, it doesn't matter what culture you're speaking to that's that's really what you know what that's about so for me i had to go through all this pain but you look at kim petras we'll go back to her for a second you know she didn't have to go through purity the wrong way so the answer is this when it comes to sports everybody needs to calm down take a xanax relax because this entire argument if we can get rid of the knuckleheads you know, the old men that smoke cigars in Alabama that have been in office for 44 years and, and they think that life is, is binary one way or the other, on or off, black or white, you know, and don't even get me started with the black or white stuff. You know, these people have this, this idea of the world that is so wrapped around a percentage of the population where they are okay pushing away the marginalized groups. That's why we have the name marginalized, right? Because there's not enough of us to really make that big impact. But now we have a small select bunch of us that are speaking up and we're pretty unapologetic and we're pretty pissed off about what they're trying to do because it's, it's absolutely wrong. We have the highest suicide rate of any population segment in the entire world. We already have the highest suicide rate. And no, it's not because we hate ourselves. The main reason that we commit suicide is because of society, because we are treated subhuman, because our families misgender us over and over, because we never get a affirmation of who we are. And it words are actually much, much stronger than a punch in the nose. A punch in the nose will heal very quickly, but those words will last a lifetime. And a lot of people, unfortunately, end up killing themselves because of that. And now you're going to have people in these offices, these political nitwits that don't know anything about the science behind this, saying, oh, not only are we going to argue about the sports issue, but we're also going to make it impossible in the future 
for you to live congruent until after you go through the wrong puberty. So we're gonna make your life 12 times as hard. By the way, here's something that y'all should know. Every insurance company in the United States treats my condition. Think about that. Every insurance company in the United States will pay for, pay for you know the transitional elements of what I'm going through. Why? Because they know it's a medical issue. They know that it's a coverable medical issue, but there's still these staunchy people that want to live in the past because we don't do very well when we learn new things. Hell, for 2,300 years, the human population, because of Catholicism, quite frankly, thought that, uh, and, and actually more than just Catholicism, because I said 2,300 years, that was a little longer than that. So we thought that leprosy, for nearly two millennia, we thought that leprosy was the hand of God punishing somebody for sinning against him. And if it wasn't that person that sinned, that person was paying the price for the sins of the parent. We actually believed that until the early 1900s, believe it or not. So for 2,000 years, we believed that it was absolutely, concretely the hand of God punishing that person. In 1873, a Norwegian scientist discovered that it was a mycobacterial infection. And it would still take over 60 years after that discovery for society and religion to concede that, yeah, the scientist has it right, we had it wrong. So we see this all, all throughout all throughout history is, you know, the church or society concedes to new points when we make new discoveries. We discover, you know, there, it wasn't long ago that we, we, we thought we were the only solar system in the entire universe. And now there's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of exoplanets that we've, we've, we've found, right? So, you know, we're learning new things every day and, we need to stop having diarrhea of the brain just because it has sex or gender. I love that term, by the way. I actually coined it. Thanks. Um, <laughs> we have to stop having diarrhea of the brain when we put sex or gender into it because it's just another one of the 100,000 birth anomalies that happen in the human condition. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I agree. I'm gonna. We got some uh, comments to get to. We got Elena Baum, who I was on the phone with before I, I got to uh, this interview, she's going to be a, a future guest on the show. She says, you are amazing. So real. Oh, thank you. Cheryl, Amber Rose. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. I love, I love this. Uh, the, the, I love the broadcast feel of Streamyard. you know? Yeah. This is neat. Yeah. I like seeing all these comments. Keep them coming. This is kind of cool for me to see this. Cause usually I just did some interviews on NBC and CBS and, you know, they're, they're very, they're very, I don't know, what's the word stiff, yeah. right? They're very stiff. With, frigid. With their interviews. Yeah. They're and frigid. so they're difficult. NPR was fun. Um, I just did a, a, a spread in Budapest uh, just last week. It was, that was kind of a fun interview. I didn't even know I was popular in Budapest, but who knows? Um, that was, that was a really interesting interview. Cause I asked her to sit <laughs> I didn't know people knew me in Budapest. Is this a thing out there? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> I had no idea. Budapest is in Turkey, right? Uh, no, Budapest is in Hungary. It's Hungary. Okay, okay. Yeah. I knew somebody. I had a, I had a uh, listener in Turkey that lived in, a, in an area over there. She's pretty cool. I was on her show. Um, oh, yeah. All right, so let's get to let's roll this. Let's start rolling around here. Let's get to some book suggestions since we got them. Uh, Redefining Realness by Janet Mock and Uninvited by Lis Lisa uh, Turkust. Oh yes, yes, her. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, uh, you did a fairly good job saying her name. Yeah, Turkust, and she. Uh, those two uh, books are are pretty good explanations of people like Janet Mock. Uh, is is a well-known pro executive producer and writer in Hollywood. And she is actually producing and writing for the show uh, Pose, uh, which is on Netflix right now. And she's absolutely beautiful. And uh, so I read, I read her book and reviewed her book. And my book, uh, you know, as far as my book goes, I had a lot of people in the industry review my book as well. And I keep getting more and more people in the industry, but I just, you know, it's already been printed. So, you know, I've had uh, Colin Mockery. You might know him from Whose Line Is It Anyway? Mm, yeah, yeah. That, that TV show. He's the he's the, the guy that's bald uh, on that show. 
he's really great. He, his daughter is transgender and I helped her once. And, uh, he ended up putting me in people magazine and during an interview because of some of the things I did to protect her from these bullies, uh, you know, during her birthday. So people like Colin, he, he reviewed my book and gave such a beautiful, such a beautiful set of statements to, to that, which was wonderful a guy named Adam glass, good friend of mine in Los Angeles. He's an executive producer. He produced and wrote for supernatural, the, the TV show criminal minds beyond borders um, he has a long laundry list. You can look at his IMDb page uh, or go to my website, amberrosewashington.com, and you can see a little bit about who I am and the different types of music I did and different people I worked with. I've worked with quite a few people uh, in, in my life, and I've, I've been fortunate that way. A lot of them were country music, I have to admit. Uh, the one the one area of the country I was most afraid of, to tell you the truth, I, you know, I didn't <laughs> I said, oh, my God, country country people, you know, they're usually evangelicals and nothing against religion or anything. But, yeah, I guess a little bit against religion, because, you know, if you read my book, you know, uh, the, one of the first lines uh, of, of my book, which I'm going to read to you right now really fast, because um, it, it'll sort of give you an idea where I sit religiously. How the hell did I go from being a shy, do no wrong and deeply loved child to a grown woman disinvited to Christmas with the relatives? Oh, it was just as well since I had already been busy running from their plan of giving me a good old fashioned Catholic exorcism. <laughs> right. That's how I start my book. And it sort of let, lets people go, Oh my God, what the hell's about to happen here? And, you know, between crucifixes and the prayer of St. Benedict, you know, which we all know is the exorcism prayer. And yes, my head actually did spin around several times and I did puke green blood. You know, it, it's just, the silliness that exists out there, you know, you're transgender because you have a demon, right? Yeah, I'm going to exercise the demons out of you. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother Sean. I'm cute. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's uh, man, it, 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 really, it really is um, a difficult thing to go through. And, you know, and I, I tell a lot of people this, that, why would anybody want to put themselves, you know, if this wasn't really your truth and this wasn't really the, the life that you, you know, feel like is, is the one that you should be living. Why then would people put themselves in situations? Like, why would you want to go through that? Like voluntarily? Yeah. Why, why would you, why would you want to volunteer for that? Right. You know, yeah. to be, to, to not be able to walk down the street, to not, to if you get found out or if somebody does and it and it comes around the wrong person right then you're at risk of them you know beating you you know or trying to to hurt you physically i mean it, it's just we we need to you know i say this all the time and you know we are way more alike than we are different you Absolutely. know stop looking to like outside sources and paying attention to what people are saying out there, you know, in the division that, uh, that happens, you know, that we've experienced that, you know, for the last year, damn near all the divisiveness and all the division from, you know, the mainstream media and trying to pit people against each other. Yeah. Yeah, turn all that off, man. Turn, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, turn it off. It's, yeah. it's not good for you. It's not, it's not helpful for anybody. Um, you know, start looking at people as, you know, more, you know, when, when I, I, I'm not above anybody. I'm at eye level with everyone. Right. And that's how I, mean, I, you might be taller than me. I don't know. <laughs> but that, but that's what I'm, I mean, that's how I, I go through, go look at it. You know, when somebody yeah. says, you know, like tries to put me like for what I do on podcasting, like, Oh, you've been doing it for so long. And you know, you're, you're at this level. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm at eye level, man. You know, yeah. we're, we're the same. doesn't matter if I've been doing it for 10 years, two years, you know, six months. And you, know, we're, you, know, you know, what's funny about you saying that is that I used to teach in the prison system in upstate New York. And one of my students was David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. Mm -hmm. He was one of my students in one of my class. So to say that I have a diverse career path yeah. is, is an understatement. I used to teach logic and, and problem solving. It's sort of like an algebra course. And I, I, he was one of my, my students and he was actually incredibly bright to tell you the truth. Um, I didn't really even know who he was back then, but you know, obviously now that I'm a little older, I do. By the way, I just want to, I just want to give a shout out to Elena. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, 
Much love. And yes, country music is awesome. I've worked with people from Brad Paisley, Rascal Flatts, um, uh, you know, Brett Manning, uh, who actually is Taylor Swift's vocal coach and Keith Urban's vocal coach and Haley Williams of Paramore vocal coach. And yes, I've met all of these folks. They're just wonderful human beings, all of them. And uh, Josh Turner and Craig Morgan and uh, Faith Hill, Reba McIntyre, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on and on with, the, with Nashville. It's like a small knit community. One of the, one of the coolest things I did was, was meet up with uh, somebody. I used to sing a song when I was in a band when I was younger and it was from the Georgia satellites. And the song was keep your hands to yourself. Do you know that song? No, no, I don't. My honey, my baby, don't hand me no lines to keep your hands to yourself. It's a really cool song, right? Everybody's heard it, but you just don't realize that you've heard it. And I got to meet Dan Beard, who walked into the bar one night, and we we sat down and and ate cheeseburgers, you know, for half the night with with fourteen bottles of beer, and and just <laughs> kicked back doing that. And you know, of course, you know, there was other people like Billy Ray Cyrus was there, and and um, and then lo and behold, you know. Uh, Justin Timberlake, you know, the, I mean, the, it's such a small world down there, you know, so I, I was lucky to be around so many people that were just so talented and so wonderful to be around. And I learned a lot because um, Jeffrey Steele, who wrote all the songs for Rascal Flatts, My Wish, and you know, all every song that you've, you've known from Rascal Flatts, basically he wrote it. And, you know, learning from him, he was sort of a mentor for me. And, you know, just, just an amazing songwriter. And I wanted to be like that. So I wrote a song called If I Leave. You know, this is going back to 2010, my God. And Nashville said no. They said, release it in Britain. And I was like, oh, God, who in Britain listens to country music? Do they, do they even know what country music is? And they said, oh, yeah, they, they love, they eat this stuff up. They love it. And I'm like, oh, they're bullshitting me. <laughs> they're, no one's ever going to listen to this. And then, wouldn't you know it, nine weeks later, I was number one on the independent charts wow. with that song. And backstory is that the people from American Idol, the, the band, you know the band that plays on the live shows? Mm -hmm. uh, three of the players from that actually are performing on that track. So I, I actually produced the track in, in Hollywood, in, in California. And the vocal track was done here. Well, not here, but in New York State. And uh, we shipped it over there. And it did, it kicked butt. I, and I was like, oh my God. I, and at some point I got to like release this stuff on, I've not been very good on my own social media of putting my stuff out there. I need to do that sometime uh, to see if I, if I can get that out there. Because I think people would get a, a kick out of some of the music that I've done because they might've heard the stuff before and didn't realize it was me, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, so we got uh, Cheryl asked if the book is on Amazon. Yes, the book is on Amazon and you can find all of the direct links uh, that I've been flashing up here. Those are going to be in the description. So if you go to the description of this, uh, where, wherever it is, probably actually, actually it's above the everything, all of the stuff that's above this. If you're watching on Facebook and below, if you're down on YouTube is where you're going to find all the direct links to this and to, you know, even if you're enjoying what I'm doing and you want to help support it, uh, head over to Patreon. You'll find that link there as well. I've got a lot of different, I've got four different tiers uh, for support one is, you know, from a dollar to $10. Uh, if you're a, if you're a brand or a, um, a, uh, a service or if, if you have services or, or products that you, uh, are promoting or, you know, Rockabella, that's, that's one as well. Uh, I have a $10 a month, uh, subscribership where you can come on to a live stream and for $10, uh, or for 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, talk about your product and answer questions about it. And, uh, that'll be on a live stream for the monthly, uh, patrons. Uh, you know, it's, it's patron only live stream. So that'll come out as an episode just like this once a month. So, I mean, $10 a month to promote. I don't think, think that it's a bad, uh, bad deal. That's good. Wow. And that's impressive. Good. And, and by the way, my, my book is actually available everywhere. Books are sold, um, Barnes and Noble, you name it. And for, for the next, I think, I think it's for the next week. It's actually the ebook and Kindle version is actually one dollar, and that's because my publisher decided to lower the price because we hit number two. I'm a number two bestseller right now, and 
to to sort of celebrate. We brought the book down to a dollar uh, on the ebook version. The the paperback, which I like paperbacks better, but um, that's still twenty. But you know the the ebook is actually only a dollar. So you know uh, if you want to grab it quick, go to Amazon. And if you like the book, which I'm sure you will, go ahead and leave me a review. <laughs> reviews are good. Uh, I love reviews. That I get a kick out of it. Yeah, I, I like reviews too, uh, especially in podcasting. It's it, it's actually a needle a needle, you know, kind of giving me an idea of what how good I'm doing. You know, when you get a review, because you don't you don't get a lot of feedback when you're doing this. Sometimes, I mean, even and I and I don't promote like you know, hey, send me an email if you got a question. I mean, I mean that that's all available too. You know, if you want to reach out to the show, you want to you know have a question for me. You've got a guest you may want to have on the show and, and see if I can you know facilitate that. Send me an email, you know, nowhere to go but up now at gmail.com and uh, I can see what I can do or answer your questions or anything. That's great. And and by the way, thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate you. Thank you for buying the book. (laughs) And then Elena, she said another one. Hey, you have such a gift, Amanda. The universe is a novelty creator. It never creates the same thing twice. Never forget how special and powerful you are. Who's who's Amanda? Uh, Elena, Elena. No, no, it says you have a special gift, Amanda. Does she mean Amber? Amber, Amber. She probably means you, oh, Amber. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't see that either. Oh, I, oh, all right. I was. I was just like looking through the list. Like, all right, there must be someone else in the list she's talking to. Um, but no, thank you so much, Elena. That's that's beautiful of you to say that. Thank you. All right, so we're at about uh, hour and 15. Do you got any burning desires, anything that you want to say? Uh, said yeah, yes, if you want to like... hear something, uh, you know, I have plenty of stories. Uh, I can give you a, a little two-minute story here or there about something interesting if you uh, have a question or if you are suffering from stage fright yourself, which is going to be my next book. Uh, feel free to ask the question. Otherwise, this has been a wonderful time, Sean. I, I had a great time tonight. This is fun. Yeah, you have a good show. I really like your show. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, maybe we can get a little bit deeper into the topic uh, at a further time down the road. Because um, sure. there, there's there's much more that I'd, I'd like to talk about. Uh, but, you know, we were just basically, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm pretty casual on this show. You know, we just talk about wherever it goes. And, you know, if I miss something, all right, well, maybe we'll we'll have you back on and talk about that at some point. But I yeah. definitely want to commend you for, you know, your honesty, your openness, your transparency. That's what this show and and what I promote is, as being, you know, transparent and, and honest and open about myself and even some of the things that I've dealt with in my life, you know, you know, I haven't, there's some issues that I talk about that, uh, you know, most guys probably won't talk about. And, you know, these are the subjects and the conversations that we need to have as people, you know, yeah. in, in order to start, I wouldn't want to say normalizing, but in order to start healing, you know, from where we are societally, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of your podcasts before, and, and they are. They're very real. And, and your story is very inspiring, I have to tell you. I, I, I understand your story as well. And, my you know, my fake hat goes off to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, like I said, it was great to have you on. Um, if you want to, I mean, I've, I've been shooting up your social media, um, throughout this whole thing, every place that, that, uh, you're at and can be found, like I said, is in the show notes or the description. So, uh, I guess we no need to have to go and run through that whole spiel. Uh, you know, no, no, it's okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right. Well, I want to thank you and hang out in the, uh, the green room after, uh, as soon as I take us out, we will, uh, I'll be down there and we'll talk for just a few more minutes before we go. All right. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye you guys. See you tomorrow. I have a, I got two, I got two back to backs tomorrow. I got a six, a six o'clock, uh, with David Weiss who is the uh, leading um, flat earth person. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I don't, I, <laughs> that, that one will definitely be interesting. And then I also have a, a, uh, 
an author that's going to be on at seven uh, talking about uh, psychedelics, uh, psilocybin, um, magic, uh, the paranormal, and the tarot. So good things happening tomorrow. Uh, double double whammy for you. And then it's going to be uh, silence for a little bit because tomorrow morning, most of you don't know, I have a surgery that I'm going to at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it might be interesting to watch how loopy I am trying to do those interviews. <laughs> But I'm a glutton for punishment, and I love doing this. I love connecting with people, and I love talking to and making new friends. So thank you again, Amber. And until tomorrow, I will check you guys out later. You've been listening to the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. Sean is a single dad, a union blue-collar guy, and he spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. When he was released from prison in 2006, all he had was the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and some paperwork. Since then, he's turned his life around and shares the struggles and successes on this podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you were moved. To connect to the show, book a guest spot. For merch, Patreon, PayPal, and social media links, go to linktr.ee slash nowhere to go but up. On Instagram at nowhere to go but up now. On Twitter at but up now. On the YouTube channel at nowhere to go but up podcast. See you next time.